the topic for today is understanding sustainable consumption through the sufficiency lens. And we're delighted to have Maury Cohen, uh, who is based at the New Jersey Institute of Technology and a real leader in the sustainable consumption part of uh, the sustainability universe. Um, and we certainly have been looking forward to having Maury speak to the Sustainability Curriculum Consortium constituency for quite some time. Uh, and I've taken a peek at the slides and uh, I know you're in for a treat. For those who didn't get the initial announcement, including those who'll be listening on recording, uh, after the fact, let me say that accumulating evidence suggests that the field of sustainable consumption is undergoing a sufficiency turn. After nearly two decades of work focused largely on the efficacy of relative decoupling, efficiency improvements, renewables substitution, labeling and certification schemes, and other so-called weak strategies, attention has started to shift toward the strong alternatives that seek to establish guidelines for maximum thresholds for resource throughput. Because it has long played a significant role in impelling demand for materials and energy and driving economic growth, housing is a particularly salient domain for considering such issues. Public policy, commercial prerogatives, and other inducements have actively encouraged the construction and occupancy of ever larger homes, and this process has persisted in the face of countervailing trends, including decreasing household size, aging populations, and increasing complexity and diversity of domestic relationships. The current situation creates a perverse mismatch between available housing stocks and residential needs. At the same time, the imperative to curtail greenhouse gas emissions and hasten progress on the UN 2030 agenda has added new urgency to efforts to plan for more sustainable housing futures. This presentation formulates, a quanti formulates quantitative parameters for determining sufficient home size based on a minimum social floor and a maximum biophysical ceiling and highlights five social innovations to enable less material and energy intensive lifestyles through space efficient housing. Maury Cohen is professor of sustainability studies and director of the program in science, technology and society at the New Jersey Institute of Technology. He's also associate faculty with the division of global affairs at Rutgers University and associate faculty member with the Rutgers NJIT Urban Systems Program. Maury is also associate fellow at the TELUS Institute. He is additionally the editor of Sustainability, Science, Practice, and Policy, uh, the journal SSPP, associate editor of Environmental Innovation and Sustainability Transitions, and a member of the management team of the Future Earth Knowledge Action Network on Systems of Sustainable Consumption and Production. His books include The Future of Consumer Society, Prospects for Sustainability in the New Economy, Social Change, and The Coming of Post-Consumer Society, uh, co-authored with Helena Brown and Philip Vergracht. Maury received his PhD in regional science from the University of Pennsylvania in 1993. And with that, I would like to turn the presentation over to Maury Cohen. Maury. Okay, thank you, Ira, and uh, thanks very much for the invitation to be with you here um, this afternoon. I uh, hope everybody can hear me. Ira, I'll defer to you for a response just to confirm that we're um, communicating effectively. Uh, yes, I'm, uh, I'm g going through the process of manually muting those people who have failed to do so, so please proceed. Okay, so um, uh, my instructions here today are to um, speak with you for about uh, 35 or 40 minutes, um, and then um, we will have some time for um, 
uh, questions and um, and hopefully some insightful and instructive um, discussion. So Ira, thanks very much again for the um, uh, very warm introduction uh, and uh, let us get underway. Um, as Ira indicated, the, uh, the topic for um, today is understanding sustainable consumption through the sufficiency lens. And um, as indicated in the introduction, um, my activities and, um, um, and research over the past uh, two decades um, has been um, located centrally within the domain of sustainable um, consumption and production. Uh, a field that involves a variety of different um, facets um, that range from um, uh, more effective waste management to sustainable transport to um, the sustainable lifestyles. Um, and um, we can think about sustainable consumption as being arrayed across a spectrum um, from uh, relatively weak uh, interventions uh, based on um, consumer education and information uh, to, uh, to more stringent uh, and robust uh, interventions that are uh, much more decidedly focused on achieving absolute reductions in resource um, consumption um, and achieving um, absolute uh, decoupling between resource utilization and, um, and economic growth. Um, as indicated in the introduction and as hinted at in the, the title of this presentation, there has been over the last couple of years um, notable evidence of a turn towards sufficiency uh, within research and practice uh, focusing on sustainable consumption. Um, and for uh, purposes of today's presentation, we can think about sufficiency as being a necessary complement um, to efficiency. Uh, I oftentimes like to explain to my students that we can think of sustainability as a two-sided coin, with one side of that coin being uh, devoted to uh, efficiency improvements, uh, but, but efficiency improvements without some recognition of the need to establish um, sufficiency limits um, is likely to lead to perverse and ultimately unhelpful um, rebound effects and uh, uh, and other um, negative implications. Um, the sufficiency turn, um, at least as I see it from my perspective, um, actually began um, um, more than a decade ago with the publication of a, a hugely important book by um, Tom Princhen, um, based at the University of Michigan, um, called uh, Directly Enough, um, The Logic of Sufficiency. Uh, and I would uh, myself identify this as the as the sort of birthing ground of uh, of, of work on on sufficiency from a sustainable consumption perspective. Uh, more recently, we've seen uh, titles um, like this one, uh, "The Politics of Sufficiency," uh, and there has been a growing number of journal publications uh, appearing in uh, outlets like the Journal of Cleaner Production and Environmental Innovation and societal transitions um, that uh, have contributed to this process of, of shifting attention from an exclusive or a largely um, uh, reliant focus on efficiency um, to, uh, to recognize the importance of, uh, of sufficiency. Uh, and then most recently, just a few months ago, uh, Friends of the Earth Europe uh, published a very important report um, entitled Sufficiency uh, moving beyond the gospel of eco-efficiency. Uh, and that report is, is available for free download um, online, if for anybody who might be, be interested. Um, the turn towards sufficiency is very much about um, reintroducing uh, within um, environmental and social justice and sustainability discourses, um, this foundational question of how much is enough, um, that um, um, we've tended uh, uh, over the years, I think, to, uh, to sort of push away from this pivotal question um, because of all of the political challenges that it raises um, and the fact that it uh, puts in a very critical light uh, the importance of moving away from 
public policies that are um, almost exclusively reliant on the promotion of ever larger or uh, continuous increments of economic growth. Um, and whether we're uh, focusing on, um, regardless of which, which consumption domain we, we focus our attention on, um, food, mobility, consumer goods, um, we can ask this question uh, that has sufficiency implications, uh, namely how much is enough? Um, but what I'd like to do today is to um, place in, uh, in primary focus um, the consumption domain of housing. And um, um, putting this into a slightly larger context, um, interestingly enough, um, housing in and of itself um, is not one of the sustainable development goals. Um, yet the, the larger discourse um, regarding the SDGs um, has in fact noticed, um, 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 uh, recognized that housing indeed ensures um, sustainable development. Um, and that um, if we focus attention specifically on SDG 11, uh, which is sustainable cities and communities, um, that obviously has um, significant implications um, for housing. Um, and that um, we see from this diagram, uh, an effort has been made here to create um, both explicit and substantially linked connections between SDG 11 uh, and SDG number, uh, and a number of other SDGs. Um, but um, the, the primary connection here within an SDG context is between uh, SDG 11 uh, and SDG 12, which is ostensibly the sustainable consumption um, goal. Um, housing has been at the center of uh, social reform efforts for quite some time, um, um, uh, going back uh, well over a over hundred years. Um, it's also uh, from a global sustainability perspective useful to remind ourselves that uh, that housing um, was enshrined within the Universal Declaration of Human Rights um, back in 1948. Um, and so from the standpoint of kind of proto-sustainability, um, housing is not necessarily a new or novel um, topic. Um, from the viewpoint of the Global South, housing tends to be um, framed or addressed uh, as a problem of housing inadequacy. Uh, and from the Global North, um, housing is problematized, um, at least in part, as a problem of, of housing uh, unaffordability. Um, but the, 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 the question I, I want to take up today um, is a slightly different one from the way in which housing um, is typically considered from the standpoint of, um, of, uh, of social justice. Uh, it's uh, namely um, the question of um, when does a house become too big for one's own good? Um, and I'd also like to remind us that um, that oversized housing is, is not exclusively any longer uh, a sustainability problem just for the global north. Um, as, middle, as the middle class grows uh, across large portions of the global south, um, as the global middle class uh, grows uh, in, uh, in key regions uh, of the world, um, we're seeing um, uh, the, the challenges of oversized housing uh, being reproduced um, in these locales as well. Um, so um, a key question to ask at the outset, um, or the, a key, key point to make at the outset, um, is that in, in terms of both materials utilization, uh, in terms of financial expenditure, um, housing uh, is the ultimate consumer good. Um, and it's housing that in uh, critically important ways becomes the determinant and the driver of many other constituent um, consumption practices. Uh, mobility, um, uh, home furnishing, 
um, and general patterns associate with, associated with a household's um, lifestyle. Um, and that um, 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 obviously housing has long been prized as a driver of economic growth. Uh, and that um, this will certainly not be a, a, an unknown insight um, probably to most listeners of this session here today, is that there has been over the last several decades um, very appreciable increases in the average size of new home construction. Um, so a, um, uh, a standard home, uh, a perfectly acceptable uh, home uh, back in 1975 uh, in the United States was approximately 1,500 square feet. Um, if we were to take this back in time another 20 years, uh, average home size in the 1950s um, was about 1,000 square feet. Uh, and uh, in more recent years, um, the average size of new home construction has topped out uh, at well above 2,000 um, square feet. And uh, for those who prefer their home sizes in meters, um, throughout this presentation on this slide as well, I've uh, tried to reproduce the, uh, the metrics in, in meters uh, as well as in square feet. Um, there was uh, leading up to the, uh, to the Great Recession um, in the United States, and this pattern was replicated in many other countries around the world, year-on-year uh, -year increases in uh, new home size. Um, things crashed out. Uh, in 2008 and 2009, but very quickly you see uh, the housing market uh, um, recovered uh, in terms of, uh, of, of, of reverting back to a pattern of year-on-year of -year increases in home size. Um, and then notably and importantly, um, we've begun to see over the last year or two um, a reduction in, in home size um, and the degree to which that pattern um, will continue on uh, remains very much an open question. Um, just to put this into uh, 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 nationally uh, situated context, um, Australia uh, sort of leads the league tables globally in, in home size, uh, followed by, um, um, by the United States and Canada, um, perhaps somewhat surprisingly, Denmark and Greece uh, are in the uh, the top uh, half a dozen countries, uh, and then you can see uh, on your own um, as things move down um, through that uh, that listing. Um, uh, and um, uh, again, to, to in fairness to those who uh, um, conceptualize a home size in meters, um, you can see here on this slide um, comparative uh, metrics. On, um, on home size in, uh, in Australia, Denmark, um, the US, um, and so forth. Um, most economically advanced countries um, uh, encounter or, um, or have what, uh, what we might think of as a, a real property industrial complex, um, that um, that there are broad-based uh, economic benefits, financial benefits that accrue from ever larger homes, um, that, um, that increasing home size uh, has been tremendously beneficial to the, to the home building industry. It's been beneficial to financial interests and specifically to mortgage brokers um, and others that have a financial stake in uh, property markets and in real estate development. Um, estate agents and uh, realtors um, obviously uh, benefit uh, significantly from larger rather than, than smaller homes. Um, and, um, and importantly, um, at least in a, in a number of countries that are reliant on property taxation as a means of generating um, public revenue to pay for public services, um, municipal governments are heavily implicated um, in this uh, real property industrial complex. Um, and we see this in a number of communities across the United States where perfectly serviceable smaller homes are regularly knocked down and replaced by 
um, substantially larger um, substitutes. Um, there are also benefits that accrue to homeowners um, from larger homes um, that uh, that a, a, a household home has become an important financial asset. Um, many people evaluate their home choice um, not on the basis of what is a, the most appropriate uh, size and form and uh, architectural organization of their um, home, um, but they make those decisions on a um, instrumental financial basis. Um, housing is, is, is obviously a critically important um, signifier of social status. Um, and there's also a, a body of research um, that, um, that, uh, that suggests that, uh, that the larger your home, um, the better your condition of, uh, of health. Um, so there are obviously a lot of, of, of correlated variables that are contributing to that relationship. Um, but uh, it's interesting not in, in and of itself that, um, that, uh, that larger homes uh, contribute or are, are, are a factor um, in, um, in, uh, in, in the health of its, uh, of its occupants. Um, as was indicated in the introduction, um, all of this has occurred perversely and perhaps to some people's minds paradoxically um, at the same time that that household size uh, in terms of the number of occupants um, has been declining as a result of demographic shifts in um, in um, in aging and in um, in fertility patterns uh, and so not only do we have larger homes these days than we did in prior decades, um, we also have fewer people living in them. So the result has been um, a multiplier effect in terms of the amount of residential space uh, per capita. Um, and um, uh, wading into these waters has, uh, has prompted me to, uh, to speculate as well as others to consider the question of, of whether there's even an upper limit on how much space homeowners need or want. Um, and uh, this uh, rather dramatic um, extra exponential curve um, would seem to, uh, at least in the minds of the illustrator, seem to suggest that, uh, that there is no uh, conceivable limit and that home size could get ever larger um, as time goes on. Um, so the question becomes from the vantage point of sustainable consumption um, is how might we foster social change uh, to value um, smaller homes? And um, um, I see that as a, as a two-pronged um, 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 initiative. Um, that on the first, on one hand, um, we need to valorize what some people have begun to refer to as space efficient housing uh, and to reduce the primacy of homes as consumer goods. Um, and related to that, the second question is how we might achieve a shift in political and economic circumstances that decenter the role of the home as a cultural asset. Um, so the motivating questions behind um, the remaining portions of this presentation today is is how much living space is sufficient? And a variant of that, how much living space is consistent with one planet living? And a third related question is, can we calculate minimum and maximum thresholds for sufficient home size? Fortunately, we have uh, uh, a few useful conceptual frameworks for uh, pursuing these questions. Um, the long-standing concept in sustainability studies of, um, I seem to have lost the screen Mark, view. Yeah, you just need yeah. to re-accept the presenter. Okay. Thank you. Yep, I just, I've just done that and has it converted over? It says I'm the presenter, but oh, I need to bring up my um, my slides again. Uh, here we go. 
All right. So I uh, don't know exactly what prompted that glitch, but uh, All good. as I was saying that within sustainability studies, we have some, um, some useful conceptual frameworks, um, most notably the notion of environmental space, uh, which was originally formulated back in the, in the 1980s. Um, more recently, the work of Kate Rayworth uh, on donut economics and uh, the uh, demarcation of what would constitute a safe and just space for humanity. And some of my colleagues in the field of sustainable consumption uh, have formulated a uh, related uh, framework um, that's come to be referred to as the sustainable consumption um, corridor. Um, and so that enables us to begin to, um, um, to sort of formulate a, uh, a set of mathematical calculations um, that first of all, get at the question of what would constitute uh, a minimum living area uh, or the social floor uh, to draw on Kate Rayworth's um, work. Um, and um, um, largely as the result of, uh, of the efforts of housing reformers um, and, um, uh, and other um, uh, social, uh, agents of social change um, over the many decades tracing back to the, to the mid and, uh, and early 19th century, um, we have well-established building codes uh, that have been developed um, one of the standards is the International Building Code, um, which has uh, come to serve um, as a kind of de facto um, default standard in many countries around the world. Uh, and the International Building Code sets the minimum living area for a one-person household um, at 150 square feet um, and for a four-person household um, at 450. Um, square feet. Um, that's a fairly straightforward uh, um, uh, assessment or calculation. Uh, what becomes a little bit more challenging is determining what would be uh, a maximum living area. Um, and that requires um, uh, drawing on the insights of, um, of methodologists who have formulated um, something called the total material footprint. Um, this is an approach that has been developed by Friedrich Schmidt Gleek going back to the 1980s, uh, Stefan Ringzu at the Wuppertal Institute, and most recently by Michael uh, Lettenmeyer. Uh, and um, what these scholars do, um, and I'm drawing here particularly on Michael Lettenmeyer's work, um, is to um, uh, calculate that the, the total material footprint um, is, uh, is approximately 40 tons per person a year. Um, and uh, that's based on biophysical limits and, uh, and global population. And you see here how uh, on the basis of this analysis, um, those 40 tons are allocated to different consumption categories, uh, including housing, food, housing, food, mobility, um, uh, and so forth. Um, notably for purposes of the discussion today um, is their calculation of 11 tons of materials um, available on a per capita basis to meet um, residential um, housing needs. Um, Scholars working within the field of total, foot, total material footprint analysis uh, have also estimated um, that current volumes are uh, five times the environmentally sustainable level, suggesting a need to reduce per capita material consumption in industrialized countries to approximately eight tons. Um, and that would leave us um, one and a half tons um, for housing. We can dig just a little bit deeper into the analysis um, that uh, the current status quo material footprint uh, is about uh, um, 40 tons uh, per person, um, that moving to a uh, globally sustainable level would entail a reduction down to eight tons um, or a uh, factor five uh, improvement in material efficiencies. 
um, and uh, specifically focusing on housing, um, the target would uh, entail moving from 10.8 tons today to uh, 1.6 tons um, at a sustainable, a point of a sustainable future or a close to factor seven reduction um, in materials utilization for purposes of meeting global housing needs. Um, so again, just to, uh, I'm summarizing quite, um, um, uh, quite a bit of, uh, of, 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 uh, of mathematical calculations here, but the, the, uh, the final bottom line is that, um, that maximum living area, the biophysical ceiling for a single individual household uh, on a globally sustainable level is approximately, would be approximately 215 square feet per person household would uh, range up to um, something under 900 square feet. Uh, and just to see it schematically, um, the social minimum floor uh, for a one person household um, would be within 150 square feet to 215 square feet. And for a family or a household of four from 450 square feet to 860 square feet. So before um, I can sort of hear the uh, the, the 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 reactions uh, traveling to me through the internet that this is uh, this is crazy um, and that uh, there's no way that we're ever going to in affluent countries be able to bring um, um, uh, living space uh, down to um, to such uh, severe and austere levels. Um, but in response, let me point to a couple of salient examples, which I think suggest powerfully that these targets may not be as fanciful and ultimately realizable, unrealizable um, as some might initially think. Um, that, uh, as I referenced earlier in this presentation, average home size in the United States during the 1950s was under 1,000 square feet. Um, so that's just 14% larger uh, than the upper sufficiency, sufficiency threshold for a four-person household. So within um, the historical memory of people alive today, um, uh, new home construction um, was roughly um, within the, the, the bounds of this um, sufficiency uh, limit. Um, New York City a couple of years ago eliminated its minimum size requirement uh, of 400 square feet for standard residential units uh, and, um, and, uh, and now allows for the construction of micro units that are approximately um, 250 square feet. Um, and these are um, now residential units that are being built um, uh, in increasing numbers, um, not just in New York, but in many other um, um, uh, cities around the world. Um, and then um, um, an example that uh, I anticipate will raise some interesting questions and points of discussion um, is that average home size in the UK today um, is 915 square feet, um, which is only 6% larger than the upper sufficiency threshold for a four person household. Um, so we have within, um, within, within our, our, our current sites, um, real world examples of, um, of countries, of communities um, that are um, where home size is, uh, is, if not within, very close to um, this sufficient, the upper bound of the sufficiency threshold. Uh, so in the few minutes I have here left, I just wanna very quickly um, run through some examples of, um, of, uh, of cases where sufficient home size um, uh, in accordance with uh, the analysis presented here um, is actively being implemented. Um, this um, um, uh, interesting and, uh, and, and, and somewhat ironic image on the screen here uh, at the moment um, is from the result of a design competition held in Helsinki uh, a couple of years ago, and this is a home uh, again, conceived as a design experiment um, that would fit into one standard size uh, automobile parking space. Um, but um, 
I think when most people think of, uh, of, of smaller scale living, uh, probably the first uh, example that comes to mind um, is the tiny house movement, which has given rise um, to uh, a media industry, uh, as well as um, um, to, a, to sort of a lifestyle movement. Um, and um, so this is probably the most well-known example of small scale living. Um, uh, forgotten by many is that it actually traces its roots back to the 1970s. Um, and, um, uh, but what we've seen is that it's become a, a kind of lifestyle movement in the US and elsewhere, uh, particularly in the years after the Great Recession. Uh, tiny houses generally range in size from uh, 100 square me uh, feet to 400 square feet, um, and the size um, is generally dictated by the need to be able to um, physically transport the house um, using a, uh, um, a car trailer. Uh, approximately 2,000 new tiny houses are being built annually in the US, uh, but many of them don't serve as primary residences, and a major problem has been gaining legal permission to site tiny houses, uh, so arrangements tend to be um, sort of quasi-illicit, um, or they tend to be sited in remote areas. Um, and I think there's also a strong reason to be skeptical about the sustainability performance of these homes um, because of their locational considerations uh, and the tendency on the part of residents um, to uh, deploy upgraded features um, that undermine um, sustain the sustainability performance um, of these homes. Um, um, a perhaps more practical uh, example um, comes out of the work of, um, of some home developers in Finland. Um, Finland incidentally seems to have emerged as a bit of a node for uh, within the architectural community uh, for thinking about the challenges associated with smaller scale homes and smaller scale living. Uh, this is uh, an example of a uh, of a home um, designed and built by a commercial home builder uh, in uh, the Helsinki area. Uh, it was built in 2016 and it was promoted uh, as a smartly designed compact home uh, and is, is one example of a, of a larger portfolio of homes that this particular um, builder uh, has developed. There are six models ranging from um, uh, about 500 square feet to um, uh, to, uh, to 1,100 square feet. Um, and uh, interestingly, for purposes of this discussion today, its most popular model um, is, uh, is about 1,200 square feet, which is not terribly outside the, the bounds of our upper sufficiency limit. Um, design is based on a variety of what we might think of as tricks, um, like, um, like raising the vertical height, height of the interior space, um, and um, which gives an impression that the space is uh, is more um, um, uh, is much larger, is a little bit larger than uh, than its actual dimensions, um, and that um, the media reception in Helsinki has been somewhat dismissive. Um, that uh, um, critics have called them small and tiny, compact, non-functional, um, and so forth. Um, another example from Finland is a. Uh, uh, studio home, a studio apartment um, that uh, these are being built currently in the metropolitan Helsinki metropolitan area. They range from 160 square feet um, uh, and include a, a small sleeping loft, uh, and they're um, architecturally designed for uh, for one or two people. Uh, and we can contrast this with uh, a more customary uh, new build construction. Uh, for an apartment in Helsinki, um, which is um, is uh, is approximately 600 square feet. Um, shifting gears slightly, um, there's been in some parts of North America, especially in the west on the west coast of uh, Canada and the U.S., uh, growing interest in what are known as accessory dwelling units. Uh, just very quickly, accessory dwelling units derive from a long tradition of supplementary residential design. Uh, different parts of, the, of, the, of North America, indeed different parts of the world, 
they're referred to as granny flats, mother-in-law apartments, garage apartments, or secondary suites. Um, they have in recent decades uh, um, 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 become, um, they've been declared illegal because they violate uh, local zoning laws. Um, they can take a variety of different forms. They can be freestanding. They can be uh, attached or, uh, or semi-attached units. Um, they can be residential units that are created out of a finished basement. Um, and uh, again, to, to reiterate a term introduced earlier, um, is that for promotional uh, purposes um, in uh, certain places, this mode of housing has come to be referred to as space efficient. Um, they've become in recent years quite popular, as I said, on the West Coast as, an, as a form of affordable housing. Uh, one of the most uh, celebrated uh, places is uh, the city of Portland, Oregon, um, where ADUs um, can be built out to a maximum size of 800 um, square feet. and uh, They've become um, um, uh, 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 important uh, uh, source of residential housing, uh, of, of rental housing in the city. Um, again, I'm uh, going to sort of speed up here a little bit in the interests of time. Uh, we've seen micro apartments being built in San Francisco, New York City, elsewhere, uh, largely the result of processes of reurbanization uh, and an effort to address the acute problems of. Uh, of housing shortages for single person households. Um, one project in San Francisco uh, has begun to build uh, what have been referred to in the media as dormitories for adults. Um, uh, tends to be kind of stylish, but rudimentary accommodation um, in some cases does not even include an ensuite bathroom. Um, and they can be outfitted with space efficient furnishing to make the room seem more spacious and developers have also introduced a variety of recreational and on-demand services. Uh, in these cases, residential spaces range from um, 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 uh, 220, uh, from, from uh, 20 square meters, or, sorry, 130 square feet uh, to 220 square feet. And you see what the uh, associated uh, prices are um, and uh, Many people have come to see them as um, an important affordable alternative uh, in what are otherwise extremely unaffordable um, metropolitan areas. Um, according to one report, uh, the hope is that residents will see value in paying for what they use every day, but not for the living spaces and kitchens that they don't use on a daily basis. Um, here are some images of a project in New York City that was sparked by a design competition um, announced by the former mayor, uh, and uh, general model has come to be referred to as uh, micro luxury living spaces. Um, Again, this project uh, in New York is uh, is known as Carmel Place. Includes 55 units, um, and um, it opened a couple of years ago. Uh, units here range from about 260 square feet to 360 square feet. Uh, and include uh, a variety of space efficient um, uh, amenities, uh, hideaway beds, um, and dual use um, furniture. Um, the building also provides an extensive array of standby services uh, and other amenities. Um, interestingly, in New York in particular, there's been some controversy surrounding these projects um, that on a square unit basis, micro apartments um, uh, rent for about two times the average price um, uh, for um, uh, across the city. Um, and um, some critics have characterized micro living as a new form of residential exploitation. Um, just a couple of other final examples before I wrap up. Um, that um, uh, what we're seeing also is the merging together of co-living and co-working spaces. Um, this is a new project coming online in Hamburg uh, that combines uh, residential accommodation with workspace. Uh, and uh, this uh, former industrial building is being redeveloped by a German company called Rent24. Um, it already operates a variety of co-living um, and co-working uh, facilities. Um, and this would be the first instance in which these two trends are coming together. Uh, so this project includes uh, 
about 800,000 square feet and six floors of a formerly um, uh, industrial canal side building. Uh, and uh, when built out, will include a num number of co-located um, amenities and other um, commercial services. Um, interestingly, this project is being targeted towards uh, IT industry startups um, and residential flats will be available on a variety of flexible um, terms. Another project is being developed in London, um, out in the um, um, eastern part of the city, uh, an area previously known as, um, this project is uh, being referred to as Fish Island Village, uh, the UK's first fully integrated living and working um, development. Um, about 600, just under 600 micro-sized homes uh, and 50,000 square feet of uh, co-working space. Um, anticipated that uh, this project will include uh, um, uh, sufficient space for 500 people um, and uh, working in a combination of open plan offices and studio spaces. Uh, and uh, the project has received some uh, financial infusion um, from the uh, from the uh, from London's municipal government, um, interestingly enough. So uh, just to, to wrap up here, um, let me just uh, say that um, that it's very easy to get overwhelmed and discouraged when working on the concept of sufficient home size, uh, and it can be very difficult to frame the issue of sufficient home size in uplifting terms, especially when the wider culture calls for. Um, uh, for the last number of decades, um, given such powerful privilege to um, to larger homes as opposed to uh, smaller forms of residential accommodation. Um, and that um, from the standpoint of sustainability practice, um, I think the objective is, is to um, formulate narratives that create appeal for the notion of sufficient home size within a wider context of the promotion of sustainable um, lifestyles. Um, last slide here is to note that uh, uh, 21st century lifestyles are in flux. Contemporary demographic, familial, and social trends are not compatible with the existing housing stock. Housing systems are subject to pervasive inertia and lock-in, as well as regulatory lag. Far more experimentation is occurring at the scale of individuals and households. Uh, we can currently observe two primary types of adaptive strategies at work, um, micro sizing um, and collaborative sharing. Uh, and these are uh, responses that have largely uh, been implemented uh, as individuals and households seek to cope um, with the deeply uh, challenging um, uh, difficulties of of, uh, of meeting their, their needs of affordability. Uh, and uh, to glimpse how, how evolving lifestyles are giving rise to new conception of home size, um, in my own experience, I found that we need to look primarily at what is happening in the most globally dynamic um, cities. So with that, Ira, I'll bring things to a close um, and uh, I'm gonna um, take myself out of screen sharing and, um, and turn the moderation back over to you. Very good. A great presentation, Maury. Thank you so much. Uh, you, the last segment of your presentation in particular sparked um, much commentary in the chat box. And uh, I'd like to throw some of those questions and comments at you. Uh, maybe starting at the terminology level, uh, because you did uh, talk about uh, a, a number of different types of uh, tiny homes and shared spaces. Uh, there were two phrases in particular that I'm not sure you mentioned. Um, for example, um, Josh asks, what's the role of co-housing in this sufficiency design movement? And another one that I'm familiar with is the notion of uh, the so-called third place, uh, which is defined as the social surroundings separate from the two usual environments of home and the workplace. Um, and I was wondering if you had any 
comment on either or both of those two ideas. Yes, so um, uh, the question first about co-housing, yes, absolutely. Um, co-housing, um, intentional housing, um, all represent, um, at least to my mind, um, uh, uh, creative experiments um, that, um, that, are, that, are, that, are, that, are, that are aimed at seeking to try to um, overcome the fact that, um, that, uh, that most mass-produced housing and most of the existing housing stock um, does not um, meet the needs of, uh, of growing numbers of, uh, of residents. Uh, and so um, particularly around issues of, uh, of social cohesion and sociability um, and the alienation that exists, um, uh, particularly across large sections of North America um, with, um, with, uh, with households living on, um, on relatively large um, uh, parcels um, and uh, little opportunity for um, meaningful engagement with, uh, with neighbors. Uh, and um, so um, uh, we could certainly, and maybe this is a topic, Ira, for another webinar, um, not by me, of course, but by somebody else who is much more expert in the field of of co-housing or, or, or intentional housing, or intentional communities, um, but uh, this is is obviously um, um, closely related to the to the general theme on the table here today. Um, the point about uh, the third place, uh, I think, uh, at least my uh, uh, reading of the tea leaves concerning uh, lifestyles of millennials, um, is that. Um, um, that uh, one of the attractive uh, elements of smaller um, uh, private le residential spaces um, is the fact that um, um, that these kinds of alternatives are being developed in cities um, that offer um, all kinds of, um, of of amenities and lifestyle alternatives and uh, uh, and uh, um, and that it's becoming increasingly common uh, for people to regard the wider city um, as essentially their living room. Um, and, um, and once one begins to do that, um, that the need for uh, a sizable amount of personal living space um, um, begins to become less, uh, less significant. Um, so, um, um, a critical element to um, any kind of public strategy emphasizing sufficient home size um, is to um, to uh, to sort of reestablish a commitment um, to uh, um, the design and, and development of public spaces um, that um, that uh, are an essential element of um, of smaller scale residential spaces. Um, so um, um, I think I'll just stop there, Ira. Okay, uh, we have a few others that I'd like to toss into the mix here. For example, Leon asked, aren't the most sustainable houses multifamily houses? With these, not only is the soil saved, but also more infrastructure shared like carpooling, car sharing. Yes, absolutely. So that one of the reasons why I was uh, at least mildly critical to, um, to the rise of interest in tiny houses um, is that they are antithetical <laughs> precisely to, uh, to, to multifamily um, living. Um, but I would also like to um, make a point um, that um, from a sustainable consumption standpoint, um, we need to look at lifestyles holistically. Um, and that, um, 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 that, 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 that dense residential development um, in relatively smaller scale living spaces um, is a necessary but ultimately insufficient sustainability strategy. Um, that um, arguably it's the case that, um, that as people move into smaller scale um, homes, um, there's a certain cost savings that results, 
um, and that um, um, that how expenditure patterns are ultimately reallocated on the basis of that cost savings um, will determine um, whether there's a, um, a a meaningful improvement in in overall material and energy utilization. Um, so simply uh, moving into a smaller scale um, residence, um, saving that money, uh, and then using it for um, for 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 other purposes, uh, lots of air travel, for instance, um, is going to undermine um, what might initially be regarded as a sustainability improvement. Moving on to another comment, one attendee asked. Uh, if you're aware of any examples of cities or towns adopting regulations to limit the size of new home construction or otherwise convert existing homes to around a thousand square feet in the U.S. and Canada, uh, the same attendee uh, goes on to ask what role might public housing or surrounding public spaces serve to reduce house size and in response to that, another attendee, Leon, uh, mentioned that he's aware that the Geneva region in Switzerland has limited housing sizes. Yeah, no, it's nice to hear about the Geneva example. Um, um, that uh, in North America, um, one of the uh, two of the the, the drivers um, uh, for uh, attempts to try to limit home size has been the um, a kind of critical appraisal of uh, unduly ostentatious and outsized so-called monster homes um, that uh, that sit um, in juxtaposition to their neighbors um, and, and have been deemed um, uh, as, as as aesthetically um, uh, aesthetic aesthetically as eyesores um, and variety of other um, um, uh, points of critique. Um, we've seen in many affluent uh, suburbs of the United States and Canada uh, a, a long established uh, practice of, uh, of, of, of knocking down smaller homes that have been built in prior decades. And uh, uh, I even speak from personal experience that my own home built in the 1950s was declared by my, uh, by my community's uh, planner a few years ago as being um, functionally obsolete, um, which uh, was interesting news to, to my ears. Uh, but um, um, by, by, by that, what he meant was that, um, that it was undersized relative to what uh, size the, the, the property could, it could support um, and the volume of taxes that it could pay um, if, it was, if the home was increased in size. Um, so, um, um, uh, I am not um, uh, personally aware. I mean, I know there are examples. I can't uh, cite them off the top of my head of communities that have, have actively sought to limit home size. Um, standard zoning uh, requirements in the United States um, establish uh, parameters about uh, height and setback and uh, side yard uh, distance uh, uh, and so forth. Um, so. Um, there are limits uh, that are enshrined in the zoning ordinances of most communities, uh, but the um, but um, uh, the notion of of down down zoning or or, or downscaling existing zoning um, is uh, remains um, hugely controversial um, in the political arena because it limits it would it, it results in a reduction in the amount of uh, uh, in the value of the property and the amount that could be realized in the event of the sale. Before wrapping up with a couple of more comments and questions, Maury, I just want to point uh, those who are still on the line uh, with us to some of the helpful links that uh, attendees have posted in the chat box. For example, uh, Valentina just uh, posted a link for a program that is occurring this evening on shareable.net. Uh, I'll take it that SFSU is San Francisco State University, unless I hear otherwise. Uh, the start time for that is 7 p.m. Pacific time. How can we use shared living and other 
sharing solutions to reduce social isolation. Uh, similarly, um, I saw another post here uh, from Anton, uh, who provided a link to a popular cottage model being built in his neighborhood. And that link is missionhomesco.com. Um, but uh, to wrap up, uh, I think I want to get to two other questions, Maury. Uh, one, Karsten asked, aren't there other means to reduce the carbon footprint for housing, for example, using different building materials other than stone? Um, well, I'm not a material specialist, but um, um, there is an important um, uh, thread of research um, that, uh, that suggests that um, most of the benefits that, are, that accrue as the result of standard green building efficiency um, uh, improvement practices um, tend to get squandered um, as the result of increasing um, uh, home size. Um, and that uh, I think that one of the, uh, and this goes beyond uh, a little bit the, the bounds of this particular question, um, I think that one of the lessons that the green building community has failed to take on board um, is, the, is, the, is the dimensionality question, the size question. Um, and that um, um, you know we can we can be as, be ever greater in our innovations in terms of uh, of energy efficiency and insulation, um, but um, but without um, without also simultaneously considering the importance of downsizing um, residential space, um, I think we're ultimately going to be unable to achieve many of the aspirational targets regarding climate um, and, uh, and environmental sustainability more generally that we've set for ourselves. Finally, Maury, uh, I want to go back to one question that came in early on in your presentation, um, and that's from Gina, who asked, how is Trump's tax cap on $10,000 real estate tax deductions affecting larger homes. Have you given any thought to that? Yeah, that's great. I was actually scrolling back through the uh, the questions and uh, that one um, caught my attention as well. So I'm, I'm glad you 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 you, you, uh, you, you pulled pulled that one out. Um, so yeah, I mean this is uh, this is actually a very ironic uh, and uh, and paradoxical development um, for um, for the non-Americans on the call, maybe it would be useful to say just a couple of words of what this question is in reference to. Uh, so there has been a long-standing provision in the American Income Tax Code uh, that uh, has allowed homeowners to deduct their local property taxes from their federal income taxes. Um, related to this, there has also been a deduction for mortgage interest. Uh, and um, the, uh, the, the recently um, uh, passed uh, new tax legislation in the United States um, has imposed caps. Um, this question here references the, the cap that has been imposed on, of t all, homeowners can only now deduct the first $10,000 of their property, t local property taxes from their income tax. Um, and uh, it, 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 it pains me in the extreme to say so, um, but um, this is precisely the kind of strategy that would be consistent, that is consistent with, um, um, with, a, with a housing sufficiency strategy. Um, uh, disallowing um, uh, homeowners and taxpayers from being able to utilize the tax code as a means of subsidizing um, their larger home preferences um, has been a um, an extremely perverse element of the tax code for decades, uh, and um, um, I don't agree with the with the the political motivation um, that has given rise to this change. Um, but um, 
uh, as a sufficiency and as a sustainability strategy, um, it deserves to be called out and, uh, uh, and applauded um, for, um, for taking away this, this, this hugely generous subsidy that, uh, that the federal government has historically provided to the owners of particularly very large homes. Excellent. I think that's a good place for us to wrap up. Uh, my thanks to you again, Maury, for a great presentation and to all the attendees who have uh, stayed with us uh, to this end. The video recording will be posted uh, within the next day or so. Uh, please look for that on our website, sustainability, um, curriculum for sustainability.org. Um, also, um, we will be posting the announcements for our upcoming webinars and decisions we've reached on our next two faculty conferences. Looking forward to being in touch with you then. Bye-bye.